Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Barry Marshall. Barry, welcome to the show. Welcome to Become Your Own Superhero. Thank you, Laban. I'm trying to do that. I'm really enthused. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to start out with a really serious question for you, Doctor. Mm. Why are you going around swallowing helicopters? <laughs> okay, well, the relevance of a helicopter is probably this, this germ you can see over my shoulder here in the background called helicobacter. And helico means spiral, bacter means a straight rod or a curvy rod. So people who say, what's the name of that bacteria again? I say, we'll just say, tell your doctor you're interested in a helicopter bacteria. <laughs> uh, he will understand. Uh, so it's similar, similar origins. It's a Greek word, and we changed its name a few times initially and then settled on that one. And the pylor the second part of it is pylori, and the pylorus, that's the Greek word for a gatekeeper or a gate. And so that's the muscle at the bottom of your stomach which holds the food in until the acid has had a chance to work on it and lets it out, you see. So that's where we found the, the helicobacter. It's a fun story. You know what? Barry, I knew I was going to learn something new today chatting to you. And that there's the first thing right there. So one, one fact is enough. Three is maximum. And I just wanted to extend my arm and, and uh, congratulate you for being the first Nobel laureate uh, on the podcast. So congratulations to you, sir. Well, that's pretty famous, I have to admit. <laughs> well, I... Uh, it's something that I've been acutely aware of ever since my mother cut the cord on the TV when I was about nine years of age. Mm -hmm. And during the winter, I read the entire Encyclopedia Britannica because there was nothing else to do in yeah. the winter in Christchurch in New Zealand. And I remember reading about um, people that had won Nobel Prizes. And I looked and I was doing my research on you and I realized that there's only been 16 nominations or 16 awards given to Australians since 19. 15. Mm, mm. So, so one of them was a, a Russian mathematician that was born in Australia and two months later they took him back to Russia. We still claim he's Australian. <laughs> well, I wonder if it'll happen if Russell Crowe gets a Nobel Prize. What are the chances of that, you reckon? Oh, he deserves the Nobel Prize for being a superhero, that's for sure. <laughs> what is your favourite Russell Crowe movie? Oh... I suppose it was um, Gladiator. Um, it ended kind of sadly, though. He got killed, didn't he? And, and his wife did? And his, and his child, I think, as well. Oh, yeah. I was a bit heartbroken. So it was a bit also like that, um, that, that, that Scottish one, what was it called? Braveheart. What is it about Australian actors? Why can't they survive and do a sequel for me and i can't you can't watch the, re, the reruns on those movies because you know it's going to happen which you in a sad mood priscilla queen of the desert hasn't had a sequel yet has it no um but i've probably seen that a couple of times in bits dribs and drabs um dribs actually, and drabs describes the wardrobe uh yeah. selection that they had for the ship for the movie yeah yeah um so um I, uh, you know, I like that kind of movie, romance and gladiators, things like that, Tom Clancy movies. So I'd like, I like, I'm, mentally, I'm still in the Cold War, I think, um, haven't really got out of it. Well, look, d keep your voice down a little bit, uh, <laughs> Dr. Marshall, because my fiance in the other room is a three quarter Russian, one quarter Japanese, and I'm still not convinced she's uh, KGB. So, uh, uh, double agent, I don't know. But look, in all seriousness, uh, Dr. Barry, it is an absolute honour and thrill to have you on the podcast today. And, and I suppose there's a lot of people that, like I did, had a lot of this periphery knowledge about a Nobel Prize and what's involved. And I'd love for you to share some of your favourite parts of this whole experience with our audience today. Uh, well, actually, I suppose people wonder, how do you get the Nobel Prize? You know, what, how do you get voted in or whatever it is? And uh, it's not, I say, well, you know, all, my mother used to no nominate me every year. 
but probably her nomination just went straight in the shredder because it has to be on a proper form. And so what they will do is write to all the Nobel Prize winners and say, who do you reckon should win the Nobel Prize? So then those answers will come in like votes. And um, they might get, if you're in a university, maybe there, say you're going to Stanford University, there's so many Nobel Prize winners at Stanford, that um, probably they have a committee that looks around all the faculty and uh, tries to pick it and put in a couple of nominations. And that would, they, that would be a lot of work. Uh, you know, it's like a, a, a five page essay on why it was important. Um, and then, uh, so those things go in and it's all done in secret and uh, they have a few, uh, like a short list that's developed. And then over a six month period, they might have a couple of meetings, discuss about the short lift, chuck a few out. Uh, but essentially, if you get a lot of votes and then you would end up with maybe five on a short list, I'm not sure. And then finally on the day before the Nobel prizes, because they have a website that they have to be able to switch on. So they, they probably have to pretty much work it out nowadays a couple of days in advance. And there would only be half a dozen people uh, in Sweden who knew what it was going to be. And they would get the, the website ready to turn on. And then, and then they make their final decision. They announce it at 10 a.m., I think, in Sweden, which is 5 p.m. in Perth. So for Dr. Warren and I, we were, we were at the brewery having a beer on the Nobel Prize Day. It's just a, a, a tradition we'd got into for a few years, but we were getting a bit depressed because every year we'd go by and we wouldn't win it, you see. And so, so we were already having a couple of beers and fish and chips when we got the phone calls um, and then won it. So that, that's, how you, that's how you win it. But you, um, you have to do science that people know about for a few years. And everyone has to more or less accept that, yeah, it was your idea or your discovery. Um, so that they, they made a few mistakes earlier on with the Nobel Prizes in the last century where they gave it to someone and it turned out to be bogus or was an error or something. So there's three or four like that. Uh, so they have to live with it. But the Nobel Committee would, would be so ashamed these days if they had a Nobel Prize that wasn't true. So they go with the facts and uh, so it's a scientific process uh, that they go through. So it's pretty good. And, uh, you know, you read about it in the Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, so these days I, I say to kids doing science, if you really want to get the feel for science, read some biographies of Nobel Prizes and the lists of Nobel Prizes in something that interests you and try to kind of understand it, even if in a superficial way. And you realize that so many modern things that we just take for granted, whether, you know, with this, you know, I'm holding up my phone. Um, you know, there's probably about five Nobel Prizes buried in that phone, in Nobel Prize in chemistry and physics, for example. And there might be a few mathematics prizes in it. So we just have it now. We're so lucky. Uh, but uh, these, these, these things are like milestones every year, there's a few that come out. Um, and, you know, that is what we, that we, having the knowledge is the most important thing you get out of it, whatever it is. And COVID is, is the uh, great example of that, just being able to get the information out. Uh, every, uh, once you have the information, anybody in Australia can make a reasonable decision as to what they should or should not be doing. We don't always come to the same conclusions, but um, it's, it's not a difficult thing to understand once you've got the information. So congratulations to the Australian government for doing it right. Well, this is something that's so interesting, Gary, and, I, and, I, and I've said this publicly on some other interviews that I've been, um, that I've conducted. I firmly believe that at least 99% of the world's problems could be resolved with changes in diet. And I realize that might sound like a pretty grandiose statement, but something that stuck, that really struck me in doing my research on you is that when you were going through your experiment, and I'll ask you to share that exactly what happened in a minute, but you were famously quoted in 1998 by saying, everyone was against me but I knew I was right. 
And my question to you is, how did you know? Well, by that interview was uh, Reader's Digest and uh, people say, what was your most important pu publication? I say, well, it was Reader's Digest because it was read by 60 million people in 50 countries uh, in the 80s. There's no internet in those days. So it was a good article. Um, but uh, so I didn't know I was right until I did that experiment. And uh, so Warren, uh, Robin Warren, saw the bacteria in 1979 and couldn't get anybody interested in. And then bec maybe because my dad was in a chicken factory and bacteria are an issue, so I knew that about that. I, I was one, maybe the only person that really got into it with him. And, um, and then for two years, we studied people who had ulcers, different things wrong with them. So then we had, so that, that's the first process. It's called, you know, you have an association. And you say, these things occur at the same time, not always, um, but they seem to be connected in some way. Is it chicken or egg? What comes first? Do you get an ulcer and then catch bacteria? In which case the bacteria are irrelevant. So everyone who didn't believe, I said, ah, oh, people with ulcers, you know, their immune system shot to pieces and bacteria come along, waste of time. So uh, the other way is that it'd be so important it was bacteria first, and that sets you up to get ulcers because then you could do something about it. Obviously, you take some antibiotics or whatever. So uh, it was an important question to find the answer to. So we, we set out on that. And then, um, but at the, that was a big transition. Um, you see, in the 70s, between 1960s and 1970s, in the United States, the, F, the, the government said, oh, we're going to do Medicare. Anyone over 65 could get free health care. And then they thought, oh, my God, you know, the whole country will go broke because everybody needs more health care. You never have enough of it. And so they said, well, look, we're only going to pay for things that are absolutely proven. And everybody said, well, we never heard of that. You know, my mum told me this was really good. You rub Vicks on your chest, it goes in and cures your pneumonia, you know, stuff like that. Um, you know, everyone knows that. However, the government, uh, they said, put up these rules in uh, in the US. They said, well, the FDA has to be, have to approve the treatment and it has to be proven in a double blind study. So you and I have got a, 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 a clinical trial of one. That's you. OK, in your case, that's good. But to actually prove that, you'd get, you know, 100 people and you'd give 50 of them the special diet that you reckon is the right one and the 50 of them you just give them 2,000 calories a day but it has to be a McDonald's nothing else and then, and then you measure them see if it's just eating too many calories or whether it's something else so that's double blind it has to be double blind so um, by that 70s and 80s that sort of thing was coming out and that's where I got taught in medical school you've got to you've got to actually have data. So we were reading the medical journals when I was studying. And so I said, well, with this new discovery is very important. Um, you've, I have to prove it. Well, you're not allowed to say you're trying to prove it because that means that you're biased, right? So obviously you are. So just quietly, you don't say that when you're trying to get a research grant. You say, I'm testing the hypothesis. My hypothesis is that the bacteria are harmless. And so now I'm going to give people with the bacteria antibiotics and another group fake antibiotics and we'll see what happens to their ulcers, tightly unbiased. And by then, of course, we had treated 30 or 40 people with ulcers and they were all running around singing our praises and throwing their medicine away and being normal again. And so we pretty much knew that it was going to work. But we, until it was proven in, in a trial, uh, we couldn't really be sure. And so that trial actually finished in about 1988. So it was a three-year process. And so um, that's the hardest part of medical research. And so when you say, uh, when you see somebody who's got some new cure and you say, how come the Australian government's not letting me sell this? Well, the reason is you haven't done that, you know, put three years of your life on the line and done it 
And so when you see someone who comes out with a, you know, a new treatment that's proven, the government has to pay for it. That's the great thing about it. So then it's free. And so um, that's why when the COVID comes out, everyone doesn't mind paying with it, paying with their taxpayer dollars for your COVID vaccine and mine. You know, everyone's got to pay for it. Um, we can get into a bit of discussion about how much you could pay and things like that. But anyway, so that was it. By then I knew, but there were other things. Um, so if you have, uh, so for ex example, uh, you know, you've got the bacteria there. I studied all the literature and I can't tell you how many hundreds of pu publications I read, but I found that there were some treatments that people would take for their ulcer and then they could be totally cured and never get their ulcer back. And there were other treatments, like you mentioned uh, in Ellen Fels' uh, podcast, that uh, Tagamet, Zantac, Omeprazole, those kinds of things. Everybody was taking those acid blockers for their ulcer, but they were on them for life because as soon as they stopped taking them, they would get their ulcer back. And everyone says, oh, yeah, well, you know, it's caused by stress. You can't do anything about that. But it wasn't. They, it was that they still had the bacteria, you see. Anyway, I found out that the one ulcer treatment which could cure about 30% of people turned out it was almost an antibiotic, and that was bismuth. And so I did my own research on that. And I, so I said, if, if it cures some people, well, then in some people, it must eradicate the bacteria. That's, that's my theory. And so then we went to the laboratory and we put the, this drug onto the helicobacter and it killed them just like penicillin. So I said, well, of course, you know, this supports our idea. So we, we'd done a few things like that. And then, um, but the, the crunch comes with a new bacteria. Can you get that bacteria and give it to a healthy animal and show the disease develops in that animal? So it's usually a guinea pig, but uh, the helicobacter is just a human bacteria. It couldn't infect animals. And so uh, I had a very frustrating year in 1984 when uh, I designed this experiment to feed the bacteria to pigs to see if they got ulcers. And this is, and I tell you, this is a funny story, but it's absolutely 100% true. So I had three piglets that were, you know, little fellas like that, about three kilos or four kilos when they started off. You had three little pigs? Yes. Well, actually it was too. I <laughs> remember that part. And each week, um, we used to, I used to go down there and I would give them a whole lot of helicobacters to eat that we had hatched out of uh, patients with ulcers. And uh, on the day, and then on the, the next, uh, oh, oh, a week later, or maybe a couple of weeks later, I can't remember exactly, we would uh, take them, give them an anaesthetic and pass the scope down into their stomach to see if the helicobacter was there or any ulcers were developing or anything. Now, to make sure that we had the most chance of getting the human ulcer disease, we used to feed these piglets the, the Royal Perth Hospital diet. <laughs> and so that <laughs> whenever the patients had breakfast, lunch or dinner, some three plates of it would go down to the animal house. They would feed to these three little piglets. And the, the amazing thing was um, they would never eat the broccoli for some reason. They knew that broccoli was not really good for <laughs> good food. I remember George Bush used to say bad things about broccoli. Um, but it's kind of a new vegetable for me as well. But they wouldn't eat the broccoli, but everything else. And then finally, on the day of the endoscopy, they'd get all restless because they wouldn't get any food all day. And then I would come along and wrestle them down and put the gas mask on them and then put, put the thing down their scope. Anyway. The problem was that piglets grow into pigs. And so after like three months into that experiment, these things were like 150 pound pigs. So they grew incredibly fast. And the human endoscope wasn't long enough then to get all the way down the pig's stomach. So I had to cancel the, the, the project at that point. And I was a bit depressed because well, how am I going to move on with this project? I've got to find an experimental animal. And so that's how the human experiment came about. It had to be me. It had to be you. Yes, yes. I got an agar plate, swallowed <laughs> it down. It had to be you. Yeah. So you're always a bit um, 
embarrassed about yeah, a self experiment because it's it is an anecdotal and you don't you can't be you can't be sure that what you're feeling is is really the germs in your stomach so but i had a bit of information my mother told me i had developed a bad breath my wife told me the same i didn't have any friends for a couple of weeks and probably that was the reason they'd all moved out of my lab. They were all working in the next lab and, and wouldn't come into my lab. And I was slaving away in a lonely lab by myself. And in retrospect, that was probably, it is probably one of the causes of halitosis. So uh, that was one of my other research projects on the, sh on the side was halitosis. So people were frightened to be in the elevator alone with me. If they had bad breath, I would nail them and ask them to be in my research project. Do you remember what the des the description of the smell was like? Yeah, well, it just it was you grow bacteria on a petri dish and you scrape them off and you put them into beef soup, clear beef soup broth, um, and then. Um, you, in actual fact, you don't smell them or taste them. They're exactly the same as the flavorless and odor, odorless. Maybe if they did have a characteristic smell or something, people would have been able to say over the years that, you know, people with ulcers have a funny smell on their breath or when you do ulcer surgery, it always smells a certain way, but nobody noticed that. And in fact, the only um, smell, if you like, that they produce is acetic acid, like vinegar. Oh. But it's only small amounts. So in an instrument, you can measure that the helicobacters make acetic acid, but but that is normally present in your body as well. So it's not like it's poisonous. They do make ammonia. Philosopher. And um, ammonia could be toxic to the cells lining the stomach. So that, that's an interesting thing. Your body doesn't like ammonia. Um, so that, that that's one of the reasons the germs like store up, stir up the immune system and and cause irritation to the wall of the stomach and ultimately it becomes permeable to acid and you can get an ulcer. So, you know, that's the sort of things that we understand now. Okay. So the, the, the it's funny, the, the um, ammonia smell is a smell that I've smelt on my um, tank top when I've done fat adapted long distance runs. So it's like a, a zero carbon, you can't smell it straight away, but once it's had a chance to just sit for a little bit, it's it's a really, you know, which is a, a ketone derivative. Ammonia is one oh, of the- Oh, no, it's, it's more like a, um, well, you smell it in window cleaner like Windex and you'll smell ammonia in baby's nappies. Uh, you know, a wet nappy, when you open the wet nappy in the morning, maybe you had a sleep in on Sunday morning, the kid's been lying there all night with a, with a bit of a wet nappy when you open up you'll get a whiff of ammonia out of it. And that's because the bacteria, the skin bacteria and that will um, break down ammonia and break down the urea that's in the urine. It's a waste product. Yeah. That's how your body gets rid of ammonia. It makes the urea, which is harmless, and you pee it out. So um, if, if it's hanging around, bacteria will break it down because they love ammonia. They make protein out of it. I Talking about protein, you know, it's, it is amazing because I used to, I used to cut up cows and horses looking for these bacteria, trying to find out which animal they came from. But um, you see, cows are interesting because they have urea in their saliva. Instead of it coming out in the urine, cows kind of recycle it through their saliva and it goes into their rumen and the grass goes in and then the bacteria split the urea out of the saliva and make ammonia. They combine the ammonia with the grass, join it together and make protein. And so they'll make bacteria in the cow's rumen. And then the bacteria comes off like soup. And so the, the cow swallows the soup and digests the protein out of the bacteria. And so um, that's how come cows, that's how cows get their protein. They get an, they, they have trouble getting a nitrogen source. And um, in Canada, they had this thing, they found out that they could recycle phone books. You know, in the old days, the big fat phone book would get you leave it out and get you new ones. Yeah. All those millions of phone books. Some guy got this great idea in Canada, and he used to just pulp up all the phone books, and he'd put a couple. He'd get a ton of phone books, and then he'd put in three shovelfuls of urea that he would just buy fertilizer, and chuck on the phone books and feed it to the cows, and they would put on muscle mass. 
everyone decided in the end that phone books had a lot of toxic chemicals in them, like the ink was made out of God only knows what. And they banned that process now. But uh, for a while there in Canada, they were feeding all their phone books to cows. Can, can you honestly imagine what that steak would taste like, Barry? <laughs> I don't know. Probably not good. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, that's so interesting. And, and that's yet yeah, another amazing thing that I've learned chatting to you today. Mm. I, I'm fascinated to know from a personal opinion point of view, given what you know about how the cows and the, that, that, that it happens in the room and everything else, mm. do you prefer grass fed finished beef or do you prefer the, the grain finished beef? Oh, I'm not smart enough to tell the difference. And uh, I, sometimes I have a really, really good steak and I'll say to my wife, where did you get that? And she'll say, oh, I got it from Coles or I got it from Woolies or I got it from the butcher across. You know, I can't find the, the, the butcher who really has a consistent uh, type of good meat. Um, and so it's funny that sometimes the very grisly meat is the, is the tastiest. So... Uh, well, but I enjoy a steak once, probably once a week. I'll eat a good steak. Well, I, maybe, maybe now that I've brought your attention to it, you, you might be a bit more aware of it. It's yeah. it, they typically are a bit fattier because the the cows put on fat. Yeah, what happens in humans as well when we feed them grains as well as opposed to protein and fat. And um, I, I don't know, like something about the grass finished stuff. Like I try and get a lot of my stuff from G Cape Grim. Um, become a bit of a steak snob given it's my only source of food uh a bit of a connoisseur a bit like wine taster i suppose i had an intern once i still know him and he said he was I, he said he was a meatitarian and i said what does that mean he says i don't eat vegetables except for chips except for chips <laughs> <laughs> but actually, you know, you're, you're talking about stuff that I do know a bit about. And so in medical school, you do biochemistry and you do some of these things. Um, so the story, the interesting story about cows, as I told you, they, they get their urea from their saliva and recycle it and it goes in the bacteria and they make protein, etc. But cows don't, humans avoid getting diabetes and everything because there's too much glucose floating around in your body. Um, so uh, cows don't use glucose for energy. They use fatty acids. And so what happens, the grass goes in, the bacteria putrefy it. And so that if ever you go to an abattoir and you go to the tripe room and actually open up a cow's gut, it's absolutely putrid. It's exactly like a septic tank or something. And um, so in there is all these putrid bacteria and they're producing all these volatile substances or butyric acid so if you smell you know feces or some rotten animal or something they are they are like uh, short chain fatty acids and they they're volatile so that they evaporate and you can smell them a mile away so in the cow's gut those um in the rumen where the grass ferments those fatty acids just go straight through the wall because they're sort of almost gaseous they diffuse through the wall into the bloodstream and float around in the cow's blood. And that's what the, the cow's brain and every, you know, all the organs use that. Now, humans can actually use fatty acids as well. So, um, but it's very interesting that cows don't really rely too much on gluc blood glucose. They're, they're metabolizing the fatty acids. And so that their whole metabolism is directed towards fattiness, I guess. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of fat in milk and dairy products and things. So, so cows don't perform their own gluconeogenesis. They, they're using that fatty acids that we're talking about. Yeah, I think I think I, I can't say what their role of gluconeogenesis. It'd be easy to find it out because they've been studied to the nth degree. Uh, but but cows do survive mostly on the fatty acids that, that diffuse out of their room. And so that's why they carry this septic tank around. It's like 20 gallons of putrid grass. And then the stuff that, the bacterial soup that's got the protein in, they'll swallow that back down and digest it. So after the room and it goes through a, like a human stomach with acid in it, just like everything else. And they get iron and vitamins out of it and everything. But it's already pre-digested in the rumen, so they're just sucking the soup off the top and the gases are going out and they'll 
mix it up with saliva. They chew the cud and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So uh, it's interesting that what comes out of the back end of the cow, there's, there's nothing left of that grass. It's just like a little plop of, there's no hardly any nutritional value left in it. So cows are very, very efficient. Horses are, very, are inefficient. And, the, you know, you still see grass, you know, uh, in horse manure. So they don't, the horses don't do that as well. Well, I find this so interesting, Barry, and I'll share something with you, with everyone that is probably considered to be way too much information. But as you know, I've been ex self-experimenting for the last couple of years for, for health reasons by cutting all plants out of my diet. Mm. And when I go fully zero carb, I go zero plant-based, for someone who used to be incredibly gassy and have the most noxious, vile farts, according to my mother, who used to have to close peg her nose when she was changing my nappies, I literally excrete virtually zero emissions, but virtually zero smell. Mm. And I've even taken the time, because I'm a bit of a bit of a science man, a bit like yourself, mm. to put on a, a disposable glove and capture one of my stools. Because I wanted to know what it smelled like, and it smells a bit like the ocean. And I was mm. curious to know your thoughts on that. Too much information. Well, as a gastroenterologist, I've uh, experienced quite a few stools in my my uh, career. My mother said I should be, become an ophthalmologist. She says you never have to touch the patients; you just look at them through a magnifying glass and write up a prescription. So that's her idea of a specialist. So just to just to spite her, I became a gastroenterologist <laughs> one way or another. But actually, so you're right. Um, this uh, issue of what stools smell like and what they're like, there's not much science in that at the moment. And it costs thousands of dollars to do a microbiome and, and actually analyze all the different bacteria in there. But it's a science that's evolving right now. And um, so uh, what you're telling me is that what you eat, you digest at nearly 100%. So, um, you know, I've put people on different diets and I say, well, look, when you're on this diet, you'll think you're constipated, but you're only going to be producing 30% as much feces as if you're on a high fiber diet. So don't stress, you know, if you go two or three times a week, you know, that's okay. Uh, that That's what we're having. So supposedly... 30 or 50% of the dry weight of feces is actually bacteria. So, and they are in there, they'll be producing these. Uh, let me just uh, do a message on that. It's all right. Yeah, I'll call you later. Um, they will um, produce these short chain fatty acids and actually they are, I was telling you humans rely on glucose in the blood, et cetera. But in fact, the lining of your gut does use the short chain fatty acids and people who have surgery on their gut sometimes get inflammation and maybe the nutrition in the wall of the gut and the colon still depends on it. Uh, the other thing I haven't said is that I'm looking, there's, a, there's actually um, a thing called, uh, there's a book out about uh, cooking and it's called Making Fire or I can't remember the exact name of it. It's the story about how humans really grew their brain when they discovered fire and started cooking things because they didn't have to carry around this massive guts with inefficient food in it. They found out when well, you cook everything, you get 80% of the value instead of 20%. So uh, that's a good book that you could, uh, but maybe, maybe you should do a podcast with the author of that because there's great, you know, chemistry and stuff in that that I read. Um, I'm losing track here. Um, so we're talking about the, the other thing is that I think that one meal a day is, is the thing. And I think it's quite natural to be going hungry during the day and then have a, a decent meal in, at the end of the day. So you, you wake up, you feel hungry, right? You grab your spear and you say to the wife, I'm off hunting. And she says, well, I hope you come back with some food. And you come, maybe you come back with an animal. And a million years ago, the whole earth was just covered in animals everywhere, as far as I could tell. So you probably bring back an animal and you would all eat it. And then particularly, say, you're Australian Aborigines, you didn't have a refrigerator or anything. 
you had to eat the whole lot of it as quick as you could, could possibly. You wouldn't be uh, leaving it lying around and in 24 hours it would be going off. So you'd eat it and then you would be getting hungrier and hungrier and you'd be more determined to catch something else. So the three meals a day is something that I think is a, I lived in America and I would say that the issue is that there's so much food in America and the whole economy is pushed by the food companies. They say, how do we get people to eat more food? We've got to sell more food. And it's like, oh, you must have a good breakfast, you know. And, you know, an American breakfast are like, they're delicious, but you can't do it every day. And then for lunch, you have to have this. And all the school kids, they have to have free lunches and free breakfast and all this. So the food, the whole economy is based on food. But I think, um, you know, if you can get through the day without eating hardly anything and then have a nice meal at night, you enjoy it much more and uh, you won't put on weight. It's hard to get more than, you know, 2,500 calories into you. Well, it's probably not, but, <laughs> but a good steak and, you, and you'll maintain your weight. Well, th this I'm so glad you brought this up because just relatively recently, I was able to conquer the demon drug sugar. Mm. And and I had I've had periods where I've gone back and forth with it, but I honestly feel like it's done. I've like I've been able to conquer drinking, gambling, drugs, philandering, you know, these other things without desiring them or wanting for them. And mm. I kept coming back to sugar. And then I've since learned that on my diet, the moment that I reintroduce any carbs, it triggers those those cravings, particularly with an extreme personality like mine. But for the last 30 days, roughly, I've been able to eliminate everything. And I've the only carbohydrate that I've consumed has been in a little bit of natural yogurt, some cheese and a tiny bit of cream here and there. And I have been I ran 75 kilometers last week, an average of between eight and 12 kilometers every day. Mm. And yesterday morning, I ran 25 kilometers fasted just on black coffee. And a, and a teaspoon and a half of pink Himalayan salt in a glass of water before I run and another one when I come home. So I'm probably mm. going through between 15 to 20,000 milligrams of sodium a day, which is what you'd need to kind of do when you're burning through the, the, the salt. Well, you, like you know, if, you, if you sweat two litres, you'll need two litres equivalent of Gatorade or something. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's just literally salt of water because I don't have, mm. I'm not taking on any sugars at all. And mm. my... My hunger is like I had my first meal today at 2 p.m. and I ran 12 kilometers this morning. Yesterday I had my first meal at around about 12.30 p.m. and it was a whole, almost a whole lamb shoulder. So mm -hmm. like a kilo, 1.3 kilos of actual meat. Wow. And, and then I had two uh, pork sausages, which were, you know, 125 grams each maybe at four mm -hmm. or five o'clock yesterday. And that's it. And and my body weight has gone down seven and a half kilos in that month and five percent body weight. Mm. I've got some so what do you get on your if you got one of these scales that measures your per percentage of BMI and all that kind of stuff? Yeah. So what's your BMI? Down to twenty seven point nine at the moment. Twenty seven, yeah. So my my BMI is usually twenty five, twenty six. If I'm so I'm currently my good weight is eighty five kilos. And I'm now 86 and a half with the lockdown and everything is, you know, when everyone's a bit more sedentary, I suppose. Um, but uh, I, my BMI is okay. But when I do like a body scan of fat percentage and all this kind of stuff, it's not well balanced. I'm really unhealthier than I, my BMI would suggest. Well, my, in my five year journey, I've lost 60 pounds of body fat but I've added 10 kilos of lean muscle mass in that time mm -hmm. and half a kilo of skeletal bone density as well. Oh, that's great. And, mm. and so even though my BMI is very high, my, my body fat percentage is, is 15 at the moment. Like I'm going to get down to about 10 or 11 before I do my run. And I reckon I'll be able to keep it at that given my current diet because mm -hmm. the sugar was sabotaging that, that weight loss and knocking me out of ketosis. So I don't know. What, what are your, what are your thoughts on so, that? If, um, I don't know about your family history, but um, the other way to do it is to get your genomics done. Have you done like a 23andMe scan or something? Oh, yeah. I, I was one of the first one I knew to do that. And it's actually on the web so that you can look on it and it'll give you a little scale for risk of diabetes, prostate cancer, all these different things. 
then you tell you show it to your mother and she says oh yeah well i knew that because your uncle had diabetes and i knew that because your brother had this and you know so you get your what's in your family you already know but uh if you look at that uh you you might get some insights as to you know what 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 you would be best off doing uh so you, you can put your genome on top of that nutrition thing um it's good to be uh a, an ideal weight because you probably you won't get you know diabetes as you get older you know as you as you uh if you have carried too much weight you become resistant to your own insulin that's the issue i was i was pre-diabetic and now okay. i'm not yeah yeah so i'm like one tenth of my readings is just a tiny smidgen over and you know so i i have a working permit in in shanghai and they you do give you a total body overhaul like that and they'll tell you every single they'll do you ultrasounds and i'll do an mri on you if they feel like it and really tell you what it's like so the government's not ready to pay for that it was like a private operation but i would recommend that you go and do a um a, a genome uh scan you just do it mail order they send you you know the mouth swab and that and they they separate it up into ancestry does cancer risk heart risk and that there's about five different ones two hundred dollars each um if you get the whole lot you know it'd be a thousand dollars so it's I, I don't know what it is now actually but you can pick the one that you're interested in and then to keep getting it updated you pay a maintenance fee it's like and you might connect it with your fitbit or something like that so i think all those things are good i think there's never too much information i, I think always tell the truth be honest um and so whether it's COVID or whatever is going on i think it's great for the community to get all that information and uh we could you know i think some of the a lot of the stuff you see on tv and the news is uh a bit naive you know there's a lot not a lot of thought goes into some of the reporting it's just that everyone wants to find something scary to tell you that so you worry about it and watch the next news um well, I'll share, I'll share something else with you. Sorry to cut you off there, mm. Doctor. I, um, I got my a full lipid panel done. I've been tracking my cholesterol and stuff for about 10 years now, thankfully, because I've been so fascinated by, by it. I, um, I got a, a CAC scan done about two months ago, which came back as a zero, which I was, I was very chuffed about, given my previous hedonistic lifestyle. But my vitamin D, which was my serum vitamin D, was really interesting came back five times the range and and i don't supplement with vitamin d but i run every day shirtless around the botanical gardens in melbourne and rain hail or snow it's really good for conditioning obviously but i get a lot of sun on my back yeah yeah I've got this, you know healthy tan for a scottish background and um my my serum iron was fantastic my B12 was good. My thyroid function was perfect. My B, you know, like uh, testosterone was out of an 18 year old man. And uh, it was, you know, it's, it's like I'm doing, I'm feeling really good. And then all that data is backing up what I'm doing as well, which I thought was fantastic. So, I mean, it's worked for you. And, and it does sound like, uh, you know, your microbiome might have been upset in some way, you know, when you were on your other diet and you, I've, you know, I, if I go on, uh, I used to do, well, sometimes I do like the fasting diet, you know, one out, one day off, one day I'll eat nothing. So I know, what's his name, Michael Mosley, I know him personally. Um, but, and they would say, you know, on your, on your dieting day, keep below 800 calories or 500 calories. You know, I can go zero calories, but some days I can't do it. I just feel too weak and and I might get a low blood sugar, in which case, I'll faint or, you know, in my life I've fainted a few times. I can tell when I've got a low blood sugar. It's like your vision is getting shutters. You know, you get, it's like stop, start, like you've got a bad video or something in front of you. And I so if I'm doing uh, a thing a bit unusual and not eating regular, so I might, I might be at a different time zone or something, I will carry uh, some kind of something. I'll carry a cherry ripe bar. I think they're, they're the best for me. And, and sit down and eat it and have an orange juice or something. But um, well, otherwise, you know, fasting is is good for you, I think, within reason. Well, I think you're, you're spot on, Barry. And, and one thing that I would say, if, if you were bold enough to try another self-experiment and you were to do this, 
you would suffer through two weeks of adaptation mm -hmm. at various levels. And, yeah. and that's the body just readjusting and doing its thing, the electrolytes rebalancing. And for me, I was doing a lot of nocturnal urination. I was getting up twice at mm -hmm. night to wee mm -hmm. and I was timing them and they were going for a minute each. And I've got a good prostate. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lethargic. I was incredibly like insatiably thirsty, unquenchably thirsty. And, uh, but then at the end of 12, 13 days, the clouds parted and I mm -hmm. had this most wonderful brain fog lift from me. And, and you, you remember I was on that Omeprazole for 17 years, which certainly would have disrupted my gut function in some capacity. Yeah, man, yeah. So, um, you know, that's it was best not to be on, I, you know, I don't like complete obliteration of stomach acid because your stomach is supposed to be sterile. So you, you, you I would take, uh, a H2 blocker, which gives you about a 50% reduction in stomach acid. So if you're getting occasional heartburn or something, but if you're getting a lot of it, then you do have to probably take the Meprazole. Um, well, it's gone. It's gone for years. I haven't, hasn't yeah. even. Well, you've, now that you, you know, when you carry a lot of extra weight, half of it's inside your gut, inside your abdomen. Yeah, around your intestines and everything, so it creates this more pressure. So, and I used to laugh when I was in the United States because uh, half the channels are like food channels, the other cha the other half are diet and fitness channels. And so, all the people who are overweight are now getting these abdominizers and everything, and they're doing exercises like sit ups, which is the worst possible thing you can have for stomach acid because, of course, you know most people who have acidity have got acid reflux into the esophagus and it's very difficult to cure that and the only cure is to stay vertical smaller meals and get the weight off if it's if it's going to cure that you that'll do it so that's what you've done uh but i can guarantee if i fed you a whopping great big meal and then tipped you upside down and shook you a bit acid would <laughs> come back well, this is the fascinating thing because I got a DEXA scan the day that I quit drinking and then three months later and three and a half kilos of visceral fat stuffed around my organs evaporated. Yeah, but that's why women hate hate the stories like that because it's very hard, much harder for women to lose that weight. It's more natural to carry a bit of extra weight. But, but in my family, particularly my dad, it, over Christmas when he wasn't getting any beer, he was home with the family on holidays or something, the weight would just melt off him as soon as he stopped drinking beer. So uh, be a bit careful with the beer. Well, um, Dr. Barry, I I would love to sit here for days just drawing from mm -hmm. your your beautiful, beautiful nutrient dense brain uh, to get all this wonderful information. But I, I'm conscious that you've got other commitments in your life, I'm sure. Is there anything that you'd love to finish on before we wrap this up? Um, what did you ask Alan Fells? What was the craziest thing that had happened to him or the worst thing he'd ever done? Or I can't remember, I, And I was trying to think, geez, I hope he doesn't ask me that question. <laughs> you can answer it if you like. Uh, we'll save it for the next one. All right. And I'll think up some good anecdotes. Well, my mind is whirring at the moment, Dr. Barry, and, and there is some amazing people that I've had the privilege on, of having on the show as well that I think if you're interested, I'd love to connect you all um, in various levels to share some more ideas. You know, the, the way that we move forward in the, in the world is by sharing ideas. We can't do these things by ourselves. And well, you might be, you know, trying to make a career out of being a motivational speaker and, and you could find a, a few people that are interesting on your podcast, get them together and travel or get some in each state, travel around and run a show or something. It could be a lot of fun. What would you call it? The Become Your Own Superheroes? Yeah, that's a good name. What are you, are you free next week? Maybe you can join the troop. I'm never free. <laughs> but anyway, it might be fun to do it, so. Well, Look Dr. Gary Marshall, you are directly responsible for saving literally millions of people's lives through your extraordinary discovery. I get shivers down my spine every time I look down the lens and see you. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Barry Marshall.